Now, what I, what I want to go into is when I started talking, Doug, uh, years ago and writing Genetic Armageddon and Aliens and Fallen Angels, most people simply cannot and could not at that point embrace the fact that yesterday's mythological monsters and legends were far from being just somebody who basically went back in a time machine who was a uh, writer of science fiction for Hollywood and just made all this stuff up. There are so many eyewitness accounts, and I've spent 40 years of my life running down, tracking down, interviewing and digging through so much uh, stuff that sometimes it can be a little bewildering. But what I've asked the Lord to do is help me to explain and to use the topical matters that he brings, the historic matters that he brings, the spiritual revelation he brings, and then the eyewitnesses. Well, first of all, there's been a history of Neanderthals uh, in especially modern anthropology, and I'll talk about two words, uh, modern anthropology versus revised anthropology, that Neanderthals were in, if you will, the human genome as it evolved, which was only proven to be a total lie. And I'm here to tell you that all of evolution is a total lie. And the thing is, is that the people who are even creationists will have to at some point come to the realization and actualization that the things that antiquity in recorded in the Bible and some of the pseudepigraphal works of, uh, and the, for instance, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And ladies and gentlemen, the Epic of Gilgamesh is the oldest known poetic narrative of fallen angels and uh, demigods, uh, half angels, half men, and the monsters that Gilgamesh basically conquered. And it's from 12 tablets from Uruk, U-R-U-K, or some people pronounce it Uruk. The point is, is that and happens to be in Babylon, which happens to be in Iraq. Therefore, you get the word Uruk or Uruk versus modern-day Iraq. But the point that's interesting, Doug, is the Epic of Gilgamesh was basically only thought to be fantasy until about, I think, 15 years ago, the BBC carried this story, the British Broadcasting Corporation carried this story, that Gilgamesh's tomb had been uncovered. And I can tell you from, again, eyewitness testimony to me, given by a very high-ranking uh, background source military and his men and the uh, women that work for him, they secure this stuff. The bottom line is Gilgamesh is not just a fictional character. He was a real entity, just as Nimrod was, just as some of the giant pictures you see on my website, Genesis6Giants.com. When you get uh, sarcophaguses that are anyway uh, are stone coffins that can be anywhere from 13 to 18 feet long, and the placement of those coffins throughout the world and the eyewitness testimony going along with it, the point that most people don't understand yet is that the truth of history has been kept from the people who inhabit history to control them. And that's why when we started talking about, you know, a certain subject matter last night about the bloodlines, etc., you know, somebody sent a message saying, don't go there. Well, just for the record, I think Hawk went there in his, its entirety on his show, uh, you know, an hour or so ago. So it's up on my website under Q Alerts. I'd encourage you to read that because, again, it's important for people to understand that you really have two seeds. From the book of Genesis, you have God's seed and you have the serpent seed, and they're going to be at war. There's going to be enmity, and as much as Christians want to placate and lay down and have a group hug and sing Kumbaya, and strum around a fireplace with, uh, you know, their, their uh, combination idolatry, meaning they think somehow that you can uh, drink the cup of devils and drink the cup of the Lord. And Paul says in Corinthians, you can't do that. That's what's happening now in modern-day Christendom. So what I'm trying to get un people to understand is that there is a history out there. And just as Daniel the prophet was told by the angel of the Lord, Michael, to, to seal up the prophecies yet for the appointed time and the information that knowledge would explode, yet there was a time seal. There was a sequence of events. It was a process that had to take place before all these things would be revealed. I find it more than interesting that having... Uh, I would say this, led the foray, F-O-R-A-Y, into these subject matters 
long before most people even would acknowledge them because they were concerned with politically being, and actually uh, many of them told me this, well, I'd like to talk about what you talked about, Steve, but it would hurt our, our, our uh, financial base. I said, well, you might be surprised. There might be more people that would be willing to support you if you tell the truth instead of some of the stuff you think you're feeding the sheep and all you're doing is preparing them for slaughter. And I won't give names, but I'm talking about some pretty well-known ministries. So the thing is is that we're now in a time period, Doug, unlike any other. And, again, I don't know any better way to say it than Jesus said it. And he has indelibly printed this, imprinted it in my spirit, literally, that not only just as in the days of Noah, so shall the days prior to the coming of the Son of Man be, but the thing is is that we're going to live in a time unlike any other in history because we have the knowledge of salvation. Those of us who have been born from the birth of Jesus forward have the ability to either say yes or no to God's uh, answer to mankind's sin. Now again, hell was not prepared initially for mankind. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. It's interesting, just a little word of aside, kind of a revelation. The scripture talks about God's angels being ministers of fire. It talks about the angel of the Lord as coming so many times. And even in the book of Acts, where, where God baptizes the, the uh, first century Christians in the Holy Spirit with cloven tongues of fire, it's interesting that the hell was basically is, is a plasma furnace, if you want, and the angels were made out of the fire versus us being made out of the dirt. And, and basically, when, when the Word of God says ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and that when you go to the first chapter of, of uh, Genesis and you start to see the creative process all the way through to the forming of man, it's interesting to note that we go back to dust, but when we're redeemed, that the soul, if you will, the spirit, not soul, the spirit of the righteous goeth up. But the soul, the wicked, go up down, and that has to do with gravity. And I mean, there's no way to contain that temperature known to mankind except in a plasma furnace. And guess what? It takes magnetism to contain that superheated, uh, uh, if you will, the fires or the plasma of hell. Isn't that kind of an interesting thing? So the word of God is is so sharp. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And so what we're trying to do is cut through a lot of the fluff where most people wouldn't believe that there's more evidence confirming the stuff that we're talking about than there is against it. Just because somebody will get on the boards and he's a shill for some cyber warrior command in, uh, you know, NORTHCOM or CENTCOM or, you know, DIA, Defense Intelligence or whoever, the bottom line is is that what they all count on is they use a statement by, I believe it was uh, Gehring, the head of Hitler's Luftwaffe, or one of the two, either him or Goebbels, uh, that made the statement, it's a good thing for us that people don't think. And so what I'm trying to do tonight is get people to think and be provoked to searching out the scriptures. And everything that I do, Doug, in research is based on the book of Genesis. That's how God launched me. The thing that's fascinating is the men of God who can uh, actually strove for the faith, the prices they paid to bring us what we have, and then the I can't say that well, that way. The pathetic and poor way we've handled the truth as a nation that has been blessed beyond all, and as a, as a, if you will, a fellowship of believers. I'll use that word that are supposedly having God's great redemption in common. We have abdicated our position. We have become apathetic, indifferent, and we basically no longer know what it means to contend for the faith. Having said that. I'm encouraged, Doug, when I got an email from a single dad. He tells me his 11-year-old and 14-year-old sons listen to every word that's spoken, and they they absolutely get this. I have I have some friends. I have uh, uh, some kids that listen to this show that are as bright as the children can be. And their parents, God bless them, have taught their kids what's coming down. And these kids are not fearful. Man, some of them are ready to go out and take on dragons. And I'm telling you, they're walking the faith to do that. Having said that, tonight I want to give a historic overview of, of the things that most people don't realize 
are not the imaginations or a peyote high or some mushroom high from a bunch of natives in the jungles. You're talking about kings and kingdoms. You're talking about every major kingdom and every major ethnic world group uh, that has had encounters with things that we would call our supernatural monsters or demons or uh, devils, you name it, they've had encounters with them. And so, as I was researching, and by the way, in, the, in my new book called True Legends, okay, I, and I don't have the subtitle yet worked out, I may have a, a native, I may change it to, to Native American Tales from the Land of the Plume Serpent. Just so you know, South America and North America, the, even the word America means the Land of the Plume Serpent. If you go to Aztec mythology, Quetzalcoatl, if you go to uh, Mayan, uh, the history, uh, Viracocha. In other words, when you go to all the pyramids, those who are pyramid builders, you go to the mounds, the serpent mounds. You can't get away from the serpent mounds. Just type in serpent mounds because the word serpent is as old a word as I can find in the world of uh, derivations and uh, the beginning of all words. In other words, when you go to the root word, or you go to the root language, when you come up with the specific etymological uh, usage of a word and start to investigate it, it's amazing because, and I, I'm going to go for a pun here, it's as old as a serpent in the Garden of Eden. That's where the word serpent even came into being. When you get into the Old Testament, you're talking about the book of Job, which is the oldest book in the Old Testament, and Job is talking about Behemoth and Leviathan, and God is putting questions to Job that obviously Job could not answer because only God himself knew the answers to some of the questions. I, I often said, if the Lord ever put me in that position, I'd just, I'd just chicken out immediately, Doug, and say, Lord, you know the answer to that.